Did somebody order a Kyle Gibson shove because the Cardinals got one on Monday night? That's coming up on b Shafe Daily. What's going on, everyone, and welcome in to this edition of b Shafe Daily. It's Brendan Schaefer. It's the early morning hours of Tuesday, April 2nd, 2024. Or after midnight, so it is officially Tuesday now. As the Cardinals come away from game one in San Diego with a win. And how about Gibby, everybody? Kyle Gibson with the shove. He takes it to Mike Schilt's San Diego Padres for seven innings on Monday night. Allowing just two earned runs, a couple of solo home runs. Getting Kyle Gibson, but nothing else really to speak of as he goes seven strong. Allows four hits, two runs, both earned on those home runs. A couple of walks, four strikeouts. Gets the win as the Cardinals dispatched the Padres in game one. Six to two. We saw good things from the Cardinals offensively right out of the gate in this one. A fun story about how I predicted the home run by Wilson Contreras. It's probably not fun to anybody else, but golly, it was fun to me with the way that went down if you uh, saw on Twitter. I just felt like with knuckleballer Matt Waldron on the mound for the Padres, I watched Paul Goldschmidt work along at bat. I watched Nolan Arenado with the hit that he had, and it just seemed like Waldron was ripe to have one of those knuckleballs, not really knuckle the way he hoped it would, leave one up in the zone and get punished for it. And so I tweeted that out. I said, right after the Arenado at bat ended, I tweeted, it feels like someone might just nuke a knuckleball that doesn't knuckle enough. I don't know who it's going to be. It just feels like one could happen. And I don't think I saw even an additional pitch between me hit and send on that tweet and me seeing on the screen Wilson Contreras blast a two-run shot to center field. But that was kind of cool. And again, it just seemed like the lineup tonight collectively took better at bats. I know Cardinal fans may be a little frustrated with some of the way those innings panned out, the Cardinals leaving some runners on base. They were, as a team, 5 for 15 with runners in scoring position. So it's a 333 batting average in those situations. Pretty good. Always feels like you could have gotten a little bit more. There were some moments later in the game where the Cardinals could have added on and didn't quite find a way to do so. But it didn't really matter. 5 for 15 with risk. You'll take that. The 12 left on base. I think that just speaks to how... Up and down the lineup, as I mentioned, the Cardinals kept the line moving, did some really nice things. Still had 13 strikeouts as a team. I don't know if that's going away anytime soon. We made a a little bit of a thing out of the 43 strikeouts over the first four games for the team offensively. Well, you can now add to that total. It's 56 through 5, so they're averaging just over 11 team strikeouts per game so far this season. But they get the win in the first game in San Diego with a chance now to go for the series win on Tuesday, and that'll be Miles Michaelis on the mound, but perhaps an opportunity to sort of flip the fortunes from how the original series of the season ended with the Cardinals losing three or four to the Dodgers. Now you're two and three, a chance to climb back into 500 in terms of the season record on Tuesday. Everybody's kind of feeling a little better, I think, the vibes surrounding this team. So we'll talk a little bit about Kyle Gibson's performance and how the lineup turned things around compared to how I think everybody was feeling a little bit let down by the way one through nine guys were hitting in that first series. You had everybody in the starting lineup today get at least one hit outside of Victor Scott the second, who did draw a walk in the game, had a couple of strikeouts. The batting average still kind of low for him. And for other guys like Arenado and Contreras, they're hitting 143. Jordan Walker hitting 200. But guys starting to finally come into their own a little bit. I say finally. It's only five games into the season. But I know that it's easy to get kind of restless about the way things are are carrying when you have a series go the way that the first one did for the Cardinals. So going to get into all of that tonight on this episode of B-Shape Daily. Appreciate you guys for being with me. Also want to shout out anybody who checked out the live stream last night on Sunday night, I guess it was, as we went for like an hour and 40 minutes on YouTube, breaking down the pitching decisions by Ollie Marble in that opening series and what we thought of where the rotation was at, where the offense was at. It was a lot of fun talking with everybody. Going to do more of those live streams in the future. Uh, Thought about maybe doing one tonight, but the game with the 840 start, it got over a little bit late. I just wasn't sure after midnight when I would have been set up to begin the thing. 
how many people would have been game to do it. It might have been a lot of people. And so if that's you, comment below if you like the live streams. I want to mix it up. I don't want to end up doing a live stream every single night because it does take a bit more out of me to be talking for. It just seems like the live streams go longer, you know, because there's there's great interaction there and people are commenting. If that's something that you haven't experienced before and you'd like to, make sure to hit the subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. I've been doing this YouTube channel for about a year now, and it's still kind of dawns on me at times that, hey, not everybody knows about this thing yet. And so I want to continue to, to spread the word and get the word out to people that we do a lot of Cardinals content here on the channel. So hit that subscribe button if you enjoy these kind of videos, these kind of podcasts, the potential to hop in on live streams in the future, especially after road games, I'm going to try to do them. And so later on this week, before the home opener, I want to try to do at least one more live before the Cardinals come home for the home stand, because then it does get a little bit more difficult. I'll be out at Bush Stadium covering the bulk of those games on the home stand and therefore not at home, ready to hop on my computer at a given moment. So anyway, hit subscribe if you enjoy the content. Enough rambling from me. Let's talk a little bit more about what we saw tonight from the Cardinals on Monday in a 6-2 to two win over the Padres. I want to begin with Kyle Gibson. I want to begin with his work that he did out of the Cardinal rotation, the number five spot in the rotation, the last starter that we got a chance to see in the one through five, obviously notwithstanding Sonny Gray, who would have been the leadoff pitcher this season for the Cardinals, if not for the injury. But it, it, Gibby, I mean, you know, everybody kind of gave me some trouble about calling him Gibby, but I don't know how many people are going to have as much of a problem with it if he keeps pitching like he did tonight. Seven innings, two runs, gave up one to Jackson Merrill, gave up one to Fernando Tatis Jr., and that was it. That was really the only uh, scratching that the Padres offense was able to do against Kyle Gibson. And it felt like he had more than four strikeouts. I don't know why. It just, to me, it felt like he was missing some bats. He was making big pitches when he needed to. Uh, I was very impressed. 94 pitches, 57 strikes for Kyle Gibson. We saw Jojo Romero come on for a scoreless inning in relief. And then maybe an interesting decision by Ollie Marmel after all the bullpen talk that we had on Sunday to go with Ryan Helsley then for the ninth inning in a non-save situation. It was a 6-2 to two game, a four-run lead, so therefore not a save with only three outs to go. And nevertheless, it was Helsley that went out there, and I think Ollie was rewarded for it. Like, I saw the timeline, everybody saying, why is it Helsley in this spot? It's not a save situation. What's the thought process with that? Especially after feeling like some of the bullpen decisions in the Dodgers series ended up coming back to bite the Cardinals, and that seemed like a pretty aggressive move to go with Helsley when it's not a safe spot. But I honestly don't have a huge problem with it, and I guess that's a little bit easier to say in hindsight, which, to be fair, when that was going down, I wasn't tweeting up a storm saying, hey, I think this is crazy. I just was like, well, let's see it play out. Um, my tendency is not really to rip a, a bullpen decision in either direction, and it's not that I'm just waiting to find out what happens and then I can rip Ollie. Accordingly, I think people... Who, who watch or listen to my content tend to believe that I'm pretty fair about those sorts of things. And I'll tell you what I actually think in the moment. In the moment, for me, it was just like, well, I think this one's important. They're all important, and I understand that. You didn't use Helsley yesterday. He would have been available for an inning yesterday. And so to think that you could get into a spot in the ninth inning where maybe you extend JoJo and allow him to throw another inning, or maybe you bring in somebody else you know, you're you're burning one of your key relievers regardless in that spot. And it's not to say burning because it's a waste of a, of a guy. No, you want to get the win, and that matters, and it's important to put your best foot forward. But, like, would you go Gallegos instead of Helsley? Does that make it any better? No, because I think you're going to need Gallegos as well. You need all of these guys to be as fresh as possible. But in this case, to go Helsley, uh, if he would have been available yesterday and they didn't use him, and he's your lockdown guy with a, a tough part of the lineup coming up, I don't really have an issue with it. And again, that is easier to say after the fact when I didn't really make a public commentary in the moment of it. But it's just one of those things where it's like after the way the last series went, you almost had the split against the Dodgers. It would have had the team. I say it would have had the team feeling completely differently about how things were going. If you had secured the split yesterday instead of being one and three coming into San Diego, that's probably not even accurate because I think the team feels very good about where it's at right now. That's the way Ollie described it after the win tonight on Monday. So I don't know how much that Sunday's game was allowed to infiltrate sort of the, the psyche of the team this early into the season. That might be difficult for fans to believe because fans are still kind of on pins and needles after the way last year went. And I'm not saying that in a derogatory way. I think it's understandable 
that everybody is sort of braced to hope that we don't see another April like that and, and things sort of unravel from the very beginning. But I think the team was in a good spot mentally to where it maybe didn't weigh on them as much to lose that that Dodger series in the way that they did. It was kind of like maybe you're playing with house money anyway, knowing how the Dodgers are built and stacked. And uh, if you could have gotten the split, you consider it a win. But hey, you're one in three. That That is what it is. But then you move on to the San Diego series. And I do think there is just, if you're Ollie Marmel and you dealt with the bull crap on, on Saturday with the rain delay and were able to come away with a win, but you had to use more of your, your bullpen than you'd hope to. And then Sunday you have to deal with the crap of losing the game by, you know, John King comes into the game. It wasn't necessarily who you wanted for that spot. Guy didn't make the roster and now he's here and it's the biggest moment of this game on Sunday night baseball. It just, it was a, you know, a tough way to end that series. So if you have a chance to really slam the door and do so effectively to win a new series and they're facing Mike Schilt and, you know, in the back of your mind, I don't know if this is in the back of Ollie Marmel's mind. I think, again, it's contrived narrative, media, fans. We are the people to talk about the Schilt Ollie thing. Um, I don't know how much Ollie's thinking about that. Probably not that much, if, if we're being honest. But it's a spot where it's like, man, you can slam the door on a, on a team that we think is a pretty good team, San Diego. No, they didn't make the playoffs last year, but they've got a pretty solid roster, and they've got some talented players, and several of those players were coming up in that ninth inning. Give it to Helsley, let him slam the door, and he only needs six pitches to do it. That ends up being an absolutely perfect scenario because I think you could easily say Helsley could be available to pitch tomorrow if you need him. And if not, certainly Wednesday. Um, It's a very minimal stress outing for Ryan Hilsley to throw just six and even Jojo Romero to throw just nine. Oh, everybody can kind of exhale. Kyle Gibson did his damn job. Gibby comes up clutch after a series where the bullpen had just been extended more than you hoped to see. And you didn't win the series. You didn't even split the series. He comes out and shoves for seven, and then you use a 15, 16 pitches worth of relief pitchers in the seventh, or pardon me, in the eighth and ninth. And that really just was was the way you'd want to draw it up if you're the Cardinals. So feeling good about that. You, you probably feel good about the number of relievers you'll have at your disposal on Tuesday. Um, Miles Michaelis has a real opportunity to put a tough start behind him where in that opening day game, the emotions were high and, and all the comments that he had made leading up to it with the checkbook baseball and everything going on. Now he has a chance to just kind of settle in, take on the Padres and, and, and revamp the, the season that he's hoping to have coming off of last year where it didn't go his way. Cardinals are in a decent spot right now, two and three. And I, I think if we look one turn through the rotation at the starting rotation and just say, what were your expectations coming in and how has it compared in reality to those expectations I'd say rather favorably because you got a really good start from Gibson, one of the the free agents that the Cardinals went out and acquired, and the scuttlebutt and the narrative and and sort of the the fan consternation was, man, I wish they would have gone for somebody with a little more upside. They signed, you know, 11 million bucks or whatever it is, 12, 13 million for Gibson, 11 million bucks, whatever it is for Lance Lynn. Like, yeah, I wish they would have gotten one of those kinds of guys to round out the rotation and then traded for Dylan Cease or traded for Tyler Glass now or signed Jordan Montgomery back or gone after Blake Snell. Um, After today, I'm thinking gone after Shota Imanaga, which was a guy that I really thought the Cardinals were going to go after. And then it just seemed like this narrative was like, oh, his numbers from Japan aren't really going to translate. He's not going to be the same guy. Well, he struck out nine today for the Cubs as uh, he he outdueled Dakota Hudson, who's now a pitcher for the Rockies. And I get it. It's just the Rockies. The Rockies aren't expected to be a very good team or a formidable lineup. But I think Shota Imanaga is going to be a good one. But nevertheless, you had that narrative that everybody was like, yeah, I'm kind of underwhelmed by the Cardinals and the way they approached the offseason, getting the three starting pitchers that they did, kind of settling for floor options, right? They established a foundation and a floor for their rotation rather than maybe chasing high upside and ceiling. Um, Gray, I think, qualifies as a guy with upside and ceiling. But the other two, you know, you sign one-year deals to veterans and we'll make a joke about their ages and whatever you, you know, whatever you want. But I can kind of already see John Mosellock peacocking around a little bit on Thursday's home opener day at Bush with uh, the way his, his free agent acquisitions have looked through one turn through the rotation. Uh, Four scoreless for Lance Lynn, seven innings of two-run ball for Kyle Gibson. That's 11 innings, two runs, and I think you would have seen Lance Lynn go deeper 
and probably continue to to put up some zeros with the way his outing was trending on Saturday. So I, I'm not, and I know Cardinals fans are going to hear this and they might want to throw up in their mouth a little bit because folks are pretty loath to give John Mosellock credit even when it is due. In this instance, I would say, let's pump the brakes. Let's not go too crazy. We can have a little bit of fun and react because guess what, guys? It's baseball. It's fun to react to what actually happens on the field. We always, I think, are smart enough. You guys are smart listeners, smart baseball observers. You're smart enough to know, like, we got to keep it in context. We can contextualize what these first outings, this first turn through the rotation looks like for these guys without saying, well, Kyle Gibson's going to have a 2.57 ERA this year and Lance Lynn's not going to give up an earned run. Like, we know that that's not going to be the case. But through one turn, it, when there was so much pressure on, okay, you're playing the Dodgers to begin the year, you're you're running out these old guy pitchers that, you know, are they a little bit retread? Are they a little bit, uh, you know, you're skeptical that they're going to be able to provide the upside of the rotation and the fact that Lynn and Gibson, I think, looked like your two best starters through the first turn, that kind of means something, but it it just means what it means within the context of those one outing, you know, for each of those guys to this point. But it's not a bad way to start. Like, if you had a decision of of you can choose whether to, to start good or start bad, you'd rather start good, and I think both of them did. And now you're looking to see Miles Michaelis pick it up. You're looking to see Zach Thompson sort of hone in compared to uh, you know what he did in the first outing where he, yeah, he gave up five runs, gave up three home runs, and that was, you know, you can kind of isolate that and say, well, otherwise he did some nice things. Can you avoid the mistakes in your second outing that could give people some some confidence as to the direction your season could take? Uh, if not, you know, then we'll be talking about how, you know, they've got a, a spot in the rotation that is probably going to be vacated with Sonny Gray coming back in within the next couple of weeks. But there's also the other side of it where Zach Thompson can pitch well and really force the issue on on his end. So, which is not to say that Sonny won't be getting his spot back. Like, he will be, but um, the, there's still a proving ground, I think, for a guy like Zach Thompson, uh, a guy like Miles Michaelis that that wants to prove that last year isn't the pitcher that he is. I don't know. I think one turn through the rotation, pretty pretty much passing marks. Uh, again, we don't have to go crazy about it, but what do you think, Cardinals fans? Let me know in the comment section below here on YouTube how you're feeling about the rotation after the outing by Kyle Gibson on Monday. I thought he was good. I thought... The stuff looked really good. I thought he was pinpointing uh, location a lot of times in a way that you'd like to see. Look, Tatis took him deep. Jackson Merrill took him deep. We know the, t- the type of hitter that Tatis is. Uh, Merrill, I think, is is a guy who, you know, he earned his way onto this roster. Former top prospect. He's he's going to make some other pitchers in the league look bad. It, it happens, man. If you're going to give up two solo home runs per game, I think you take that if you are basically honing in on every other element and every other inning of your game the way that Kyle Gibson did got to feel pretty good about the way that that panned out. I don't know that he's going to give you seven and two every time he goes out there, but he did the first time. And if you're a Cardinals fan, I think you feel pretty good about that. You also feel pretty good, I imagine, about the way the offense looked tonight. Brandon Donovan is back. Uh, look, and I, I saw a comment on Twitter that said, well, did he ever leave? And I said, well, there were some at-bats that didn't look right. I mean, if you joined the live stream last night or had listened to B-Shape Daily earlier in the weekend, we we talked a little bit, bit about just the the strikeouts looking by Donovan, it just seemed like he wasn't 100% comfortable, 100% uh, sure of himself on certain pitches with what he wanted to uh, try to accomplish. And I, I think yesterday he stung the ball for a, a two RBI double, if I'm recalling correctly, on Sunday. And then today he goes three for four, scores three runs, a couple of RBIs on the home run that he hit, just a screaming liner over the right field wall, and also reached base via walk. So he was on four times. He's got the OPS up to 848. We're going to start to see these season-long numbers as you add games and add games like the one Donovan had tonight. Everything's going to begin to level out a little bit, but he had a fantastic game as the table setter. Don't tell me Brendan Donovan's not a leadoff hitter. He's a leadoff hitter who's going to get on base at a really impressive clip. He's going to hit for some power. I would project, you know, uh, more than 10 home runs. I would say 12 to 15 home runs is, is well within reach for a guy like Donovan. He is just a really good ball player, and I would continue to lead him off even after Lars Newbar returns. Uh, I, th- I think you probably put Newt Bar in the three hole with Gorman bumping down a little lower in the lineup. Ideally, you put Gorman fifth and and sandwich him between Arenado and Wilson Contreras. Um, Contreras may have you know a better better run than Gorman right now. Gorman's uh, sitting there with a two twenty seven average and a, a five thirty four OPS after a one for five performance today. A couple of strikeouts. Uh, Contreras obviously the big home run there in the first inning. I just feel like they may go for that left, right, left, right. But for me, it's Donovan that I want at the top. Um, 
Gorman, I think, consistency-wise, is going to be better suited to be a little bit lower in the lineup. You can make the argument that, well, it's beneficial to him to be protected by Arenado, batting behind him. Maybe Gorman sees better pitches to hit. I think that's sort of an antiquated thought process. I don't know. There are going to be times throughout the season where that's going to be true, where Nolan Arenado is going to be such a presence in the lineup because he's just he's just seen the ball so well, and he's he's just crushing opposing pitching, and his presence is unmistakable. I don't think he's right in that spot just now, but had a good night tonight, two for five, uh, an RBI and a run scored as well. But I think there are going to be times throughout the year where you'll be able to feel that, and it could be beneficial to have a guy like Gorman batting ahead of a guy who's going in that route. But as of right now, I just don't know if it's actually that big of a difference. Like if you're the opposing pitcher, you're not thinking, all right, the guy on deck, you know, is really dangerous, so we have to do something different to Gorman. You're thinking, we're going to try to get him out of the zone and, and make him chase a pitch low, make him chase that breaking ball below the strike zone. It's been working to a pretty good degree so far. He's striking out at a fair clip, and that's the way pitchers are going to approach him, I think, regardless of where he bats. So I want a little bit more consistency in the three-hole, and I think Gorman, uh, it could be a benefit to the lineup to say, well, we've got a guy batting fifth that can be a 35-plus home run hitter in, in the big leagues. Like, if he continues uh, to just develop and grow in his game, I'm not counting Gorman out of anything like that just through five games. And then having maybe Wilson Contreras bat in sixth, suddenly you're like, well, that is a really potent one through six on paper. The guys all have to perform, of course, but I think you really like what the potential there is on paper. And then Jordan Walker. Yes, the strikeouts are still sort of out of control a little bit for Jay Walker right now, but he goes two for five tonight, had some good swings that he put on the ball despite the three strikeouts and the other at-bats had a ridiculous Air Jordan flying lay it out catch in right field that he sort of gave the Michael Jordan shrug afterwards coming off the field. I love that the Bally Sports Midwest cameras caught that from Walker. Just kind of like, yeah, it, you know, I don't know. It is what it is. So really good to see him have a moment like that. and Maybe that allows him to build a little bit of confidence defensively. He is an athlete, an athletic guy. Um, just a matter of time, I think, before he gets going consistently offensively. And then maybe a little bit uh, in the defensive department as well. But he's your seventh batter. And I think that if he gets going one through seven, ends up just being really potent for this lineup. And then if eight, nine is Victor Scott and Mason win, like we saw uh, later on in the game, I forget which inning it was, but you had Scott get on base with the walk and then Mason win with the bunt hit, which you can basically do, right? Um, I would rather be a little bit aggressive and see just Victor Scott take second base. I think I think second base is rightfully his. Just any time you get into a situation where he's on first base, spend a pitch or two if you're the batter in the batter's box and just wait a moment so he can steal second. And then if you want to bunt him over to third, then that's all the more power to you. And now you potentially have a guy on third base with less than two outs. Um, but in the case of Mason Wynn, he also can bunt for a base hit, which Matt Carpenter did tonight. Mason Wynn effectively does that as well, but they weren't able to drive those two in, which is unfortunate. But yeah, man, I think it's really fun when you have a one through seven that on paper looks as potent as this lineup could. And then you have, you know, guys at eight and nine who are your most athletic players, perhaps offensively. And and just in terms of the speed and athleticism that they they bring, they can do a lot of things. They can steal a base. They can get on base in, in unusual and unique ways to be able to set the table for the guys at the top. So this lineup is one that I think for the Cardinals could be very potent. We talked about maybe being concerned about the way the first series went and the more games the Cardinals play against teams who are not the Dodgers the more we'll be able to kind of settle in and know okay was what we saw in that first series the result of the Cardinals just playing the best team in baseball or one of the the very best teams in baseball or you know was it something that that we can look back on as a sign of things to come but I would say tonight you you know even even against a knuckleballer it was kind of coming into the game one of those thoughts where maybe you could have some concern that, uh-oh, you know, if if push comes to shove, it's going to be one of those nights because this is a, a unique and kind of different pitcher. For years, it was, oh, the, the soft-tossing lefty that the Cardinals hadn't seen before. They can't do anything with a guy like that. And so even though on paper this should be a matchup where they could rake, it feels like they won't. That was often kind of narrative-driven. I think after a number of years, the Cardinals would – be able to dispel that but at times it still feel like it pops up on you and so tonight I thought well it's the knuckleballer that's going to be the thing that if they get got they get got and for a number of at-bats they did Waldron had seven strikeouts in four innings he was he was making guys look silly at times but if that knuckleball is not crispy every single time 
you are going to find times where you'll pay for it. And he did against Contreras, and the Cardinals were able to get four runs against him, nine hits against him in those four innings, also walked a man. So I would say up and down the lineup, they did their job. They added on a couple runs as well against Johnny Brito, courtesy of the Brendan Donovan home run in the sixth inning. A nice all-around performance, I think, from the team tonight. Offense did its job. It could have capitalized a little bit more than the 5-for-15 with Risp. But again, that's 333. You know, you get a, you get on base as often as the Cardinals did tonight. You're going to leave some guys on base, and that's not going to be the end of the world. And the, we mentioned Kyle Gibson and the bullpen kind of doing their jobs. I think you can be a little more confident in what the lineup is able to do. That's maybe the key takeaway. I mean, obviously, Kyle Gibson's a key takeaway as well. This was a complete game by the Cardinals. It's just because, and I'll continue to reiterate it, the the Cardinals are built in such a way that the lineup will have to carry them. Like, I, I think with the way that they were constructed, you expect Kyle Gibson to do the six or seven innings, but maybe give up like four runs. And in a world where that was tonight, the Cardinals still win this game because they win six to four and the lineup ends up being the thing that carried it to that victory. Uh, they had margin for error tonight because of Kyle Gibson's excellent performance. But typically you're going to see that the quality starts that guys like he, that, that Kyle Gibson, uh, also known as Gibby, of course, Guys like him will give that kind of performance. It'll be a six and three. It'll be a seven inning and four. It'll be something like that. He can be efficient, but he's not always going to hold you to two earned. He did tonight, and that allowed you to have a little bit of breathing room. But the lineup getting the six runs, I think that's going to be the number that you're going to want to circle. And I know that's not anything super revelatory. Like, well, if you score six runs, you're going to have a great chance to win the game. Yeah, no, duh. I think that's going to be true of many baseball teams throughout a season and it's just the nature of that being a pretty impressive run total to be able to put up. There's a reason you get cheap drinks when it happens, right, Cardinals fans? But this team in particular, because you look at the back end of your rotation and guys like Gibson, who, yeah, you had like a 4-7 ERA last year, but he tends to pile up some quality starts. Lance Lynn can do the same, or at times maybe Lance Lynn has that spotty inning where he gives up three or four but then he finds a way to grit through and still finds uh, the the path and the avenue to get through six or seven innings, that's going to be the game where you need five or six runs to win it and and maybe six because otherwise your bullpen has no margin uh, over three or or so innings to cough up a run here or there. So that's where it really comes into play that the offense doing the job that they did tonight is so instrumental. And to see the various guys come to life Again, through four games, you're going, well, here's a guy with a 100 batting average, and here's a guy hitting below 100, and how concerned should you be? It's not that I thought this is the version of the Cardinals that that we're going to see in 2024 offensively. It's just, hey, whatever they are going to be, we do have to keep in mind that it's important they be great because I think with how they're constructed, they need to be a top offense, and tonight they looked more like one. Donovan coming around, looking really good, seeing the ball well. Goldschmidt is is picking his spots, had the RBI hit, reached base via walk as well. Um, you know, Gorman had a couple of strikeouts, but at least get one hit. Like, if that's your bad day at the yard, that's not so bad. One for five, and, and then maybe you can build upon that. Arenado, I think, is seeing it much better. Had some really good Nolan-looking swings with his two for five and an RBI tonight. It was a, a double that got things going there in the first inning, and that was a, a sharp liner that, that looked good to left field. So, he, if he can kind of get back to being himself in short order, Contreras with the homer. Carpenter was the infield hit wizard tonight. I mentioned Walker and, and Mason Wynn as well. I don't know if I, I touched on him before, but he was two for five with a run scored as well. In addition to uh, the bunt hit, had another base hit tonight. And he's got a 357 average. The OPS is only 714 because he's mostly been a singles merchant to this point. But uh, I do think you'll you'll see Mason Wynn start to put the balls in the gaps and and that'll go for doubles and triples, and, and and he'll get his fair share as well of home runs throughout the year. So all in all, just a really encouraging night, I think, from the St. Louis Cardinals. Let me know in the comments section what y'all thought about the game as they improve on the season to a 2-3 and three record and get a moment to sort of exhale, put the bad taste of the Dodgers series behind them, get it out of their mouths, and say, all right, it's kind of time to settle into the season. Not much time to rest and relax, though, because on Tuesday, Miles Michaelis, who's got the 10 ERA, we know how it went for him in the first game. He's going to have a task against him here, uh, 840 for the first pitch once again. So, man, it's going to be late if I'm going to try to do a live stream. But if you're demanding it, Cardinals fans, I will make it happen. So uh, anybody who prefers the live streams to just these podcasts, 
put it in the YouTube comments. But also, if you prefer it the other way, I like to kind of know what people think, how they consume the show. It's interesting to me. So just comment with your thoughts if that's anything you want to share as far as uh, how you like to listen and, and what format you prefer. But the reason that the Cardinals have not a long time to rest here is it'll be you, Darvish, on Tuesday night. And he had a really good first start of the season. Uh, the ERA is at 1.04. So that what's that mean? He went seven or eight innings and gave up a run. Probably eight, eight and change, maybe, something to that effect. Not entirely sure. Actually, it may be that he's pitched twice because I think he pitched in the Korea series as well. But 10 strikeouts uh, for you, Darvish. He's got a one ERA. So Cardinals are somewhat familiar with him over the years. We'll give you a little game preview action right here because I can pull up the pitcher versus uh, batter stats when it comes to you, Darvish, and the Cardinals. Arenado's 8 for 20 against him with three home runs, so keep an eye on him tomorrow. It's a 400 batting average and an 850 slug. Uh, looks like 6 for 14 for Matt Carpenter, so maybe you see him in the lineup again. Was in there tonight at DH in lieu of Burleson. Those two have been sort of ping-ponging back and forth. I figure they'll get Burley at least one more shot at it. Uh, maybe there's a lefty coming up that could change that, but I imagine they'll do that for Burley before opening day or the, the home opener, rather, on Thursday because Carpenter will almost certainly be in there for the, the ovation on, on the home opener Thursday against Miami. But a home run with three doubles and 14 at-bats, six hits for Carpenter against Darvish, so that's pretty favorable. Two for eight for Wilson, three for 18 for Crawford, so maybe not a day that he comes in, but he does have a home run in those three hits against you, Darvish. Two for four for Donovan, nine for 31 for Paul Goldschmidt uh, with a, a decent enough OPS and a home run to boot. And then uh, 0 for four for Miles Michaelis. So I just, for me... Tomorrow, I mean, Ollie Marmel, if you're going to try to put Miles Michaelis into this game offensively, I think it's a mistake. The splits just do not justify it. So keep him as the pitcher. Don't pull the DH. Don't don't try to pretend this is Otani here. The guy's 0 for 4 with 3 Ks against Darvish in his career. I, I just don't think under any circumstances you can afford to put Michaelis in that batter's box tomorrow. Let me know what you think, Cardinals fans, <laughs> as we wrap up this edition of B-Shape Daily. Appreciate you guys, as always, for watching, for listening, for consuming the content in whatever form that you do. Thank you guys so much. Make sure you hit that subscribe button in the lower right-hand corner and hit like on this video before you get out of here if you're listening on YouTube. Keep subscribing and following on Spotify as well. It's always a treat to see the uh, follower count go up on that application, too. That's going to do it for this edition of the show. Thank you guys so much, and we'll talk to you next time on B-Shave Daily. Peace.